Hi everyone, I'm Lalit Suresh from VMA Research, and today I'm excited to tell you about our work on simplifying cluster managers using declarative programming. No matter what you run in your data center, whether it's VMs or containers or serverless functions or what have you, there's going to be many layers of cluster management code that's responsible for taking these workloads, assigning them resources, and configuring the underlying infrastructure according to various policies. Today, I'm going to tell you why writing this type of policy-based cluster management code is notoriously hard to get right, because the underlying algorithmic problems are quite challenging. And rather than having developers write code by hand to solve these problems, we're instead going to advocate that we should code generate the required implementations instead from high-level specifications. To make this discussion a bit more concrete, I'm going to use the running example of the Kubernetes scheduler throughout this talk, but just keep in mind that neither the problem nor the solution is specific to Kubernetes. So the goal of the scheduler is to take pods and assign them to nodes. So pods are containers, nodes are physical or virtual machines. Now, these pods come with various kinds of requirements, like they might have CPU and memory requirements, they might have affinity constraints, anti-affinity constraints, and even soft constraints, like load balancing needs. In total, the scheduler supports some 30 different hard and soft constraints that you can configure. And its goal is to basically ingest all of this information about the cluster and find high quality assignments of pods to nodes such that all these constraints are satisfied. So what we're dealing with here is an example of a multi-dimensional bin packing problem with constraints, which is a known NP hard problem. But if you peek under the covers to look at how systems like the Kubernetes scheduler are built today, we'll basically find that it's a collection of purpose-built best effort heuristics, which evaluate different constraints and have to be changed together in order to figure out how to assign pods to nodes. But we find that this is hardly unique by any means to the Kubernetes scheduler. Looking at different examples of policy-based cluster management code in the industry, both in the context of commercial systems as well as open source ones, we find that this seems to be the norm. Developers are coming up with ad hoc heuristics to solve the same kinds of challenging problems in slightly different settings. And this worries us for several reasons. First of all, it requires a lot of engineering effort to make these systems scale and perform well, especially as the kinds of constraints get more, sad, uh, more complicated. Second, by their best effort nature, these heuristics tend to sacrifice decision quality in order to perform well, because they don't really cover the search space very well. And in doing so, they might even miss feasible solutions, forget optimal solutions. And this actually leads to a lot of operational friction. And lastly, we find that these heuristic-based systems are quite, to, quite hard to extend and evolve over time. When it's time to add new policies, new types of constraints, or even features, developers keep having to going back to these heuristics to patch them to now work with an even larger set of constraints and worse, arbitrary combinations of them. And that's where things really get out of hand. So given how often this problem seems to be solved over and over again in the industry, we think this current approach of writing ad hoc heuristics to solve these algorithmic, algorithmically challenging problems is not tenable. And so we think we should approach these type of problems from a ra radically different angle. And with that in mind, we propose DCM, or declarative cluster managers. To go back to our running example, to use DCM here, you would first maintain the state of your cluster in an SQL database. So you might have an in-memory embedded SQL database where you now have a schema representing your pods, nodes, and other information. Against the schema, you specify constraints again in SQL. And from this declarative specification of the state of the system in the form of a schema and the constraints as well, it turns out we have enough information for a compiler to generate a block of code that you can run instead of these heuristics. And what this generated code does is that it pulls in the latest state from the database, efficiently encodes that as an optimization problem that it then solves using an off-the-shelf constraint solver. And we can wire the results back to the calling code. And this pipeline can be executed quite efficiently even at the low millisecond time scales. And in doing so, we find that DCM significantly lowers the barrier to building cluster management code that scales well, computes high quality decisions, and is extensible. And we validate these claims by using DCM to power three different use cases. We've built a Kubernetes scheduler with DCM. We've also built a VM load balancing utility in the context of a commercial resource manager. 
And in the context of a distributed transactional data store, we built a policy-based configuration layer. For scalability, we find that our DCM-powered Kubernetes scheduler is up to two times faster at the 95th percentile when it comes to bringing up pods end-to-end -end, compared to the baseline scheduler, which has benefit from, benefited from a lot of handcrafted optimizations instead. And we validate this on a 500 node scale cluster, and we'll see more details about this experiment later. In two of these use cases, we find that by virtue of using a constraint solver under the covers, uh, DCM just finds better quality decisions, which translates into things like better load balancing, better resource efficiency, as well as just a higher chance of finding solutions at all, especially in these type of tightly constrained scenarios, which happen in smaller scale enterprise deployments. And across all three cases, we found that DCM powered systems were quite easy to extend. Adding new policies is just a matter of adding a few more lines of SQL. And even adding non-trivial features, like making a Kubernetes scheduler not just place pods, but also VMs and reasoning about them in a unified way was quite easy to do with our DCM-powered Kubernetes scheduler. But with the baseline, heuristic-based one, it would have required a complete overhaul. So with this sort of high-level overview in mind, let's uh, dig a bit more into the details. Let's see how it's like to program with DCM first. So like I mentioned earlier, in order to use DCM, you have to first design a schema that represents the state of your cluster. So our Kubernetes scheduler has some 30 different tables, but here I'm just going to show you two. So you can imagine at the very least, there's going to be a table of pods, there's going to be a table of nodes. The pods table will have a node column because pods have to be assigned to nodes. And this has a foreign key relationship, so all the usual SQL stuff. But because we want DCM to find these assignments of pods to nodes for us, we're going to tag the node column as a variable column. And what this tells DCM is that eventually in the generated code, the cells in this node column have to be treated as decision variables, which we're going to use a constraint solver to assign values to. And the range of possible values for the cells are drawn from the neighboring column because of the foreign key relationship. Now, in order to make this primitive useful, we need to start defining constraints. So DCM supports both hard and soft constraints. You write a hard constraint by creating a view which selects some rows and then specifies some predicate which should hold true against each of these rows. As a simple example, we might say something like, if I join these two tables according to their node columns, then pods should only be assigned to nodes who report that they are not under any memory overload. So that's a simple example. In practice, the constraints look a bit more complicated than this. Similarly, there are soft constraints as well. So again, you write a view, but this time you provide us an expression whose value we have to maximize. So one way we find ourselves using this primitive is in specifying, say, uh, an intermediate view, which calculates the spare memory capacity per node. And you can do this by joining and aggregating the two base tables. Now note that the spare memory capacity value itself is a variable because it depends on the assignment of pods to nodes, but all you have to do is declare this. DCM will take care of what goes on under the covers for you. And once you have such a view, you can just state that you want to maximize the minimum spare capacity. And this causes pods to be spread across nodes according to this quality metric. So in this style, we basically express cluster management policies as constraints quite concisely using SQL. And these constraints can easily span multiple tables, which is a key strength of SQL. And we use standard SQL constructs to do so, like joins, aggregates, group buys, correlated subqueries, and whatnot. Now, the actual programs that you write will look like this. You basically create models, which are parameterized by a connection to the database and the constraints that you write in SQL. And from the connection, we get the schema. And when you call create, what happens under the covers is that we generate this code, compile it, load it into memory, wrap it in this model object, and give it back to you. And when you call model solve, all these tables go in, and out comes the same tables, but with values assigned to the variable columns. So that's the programming model. And with this approach, we can basically instantiate different models for different tasks that run at different time scales. So you might say, you might have a model in your system to do fast incremental placement of newly arriving tasks. And if that doesn't work, you might fall back to a slower model that tries to preempt existing tasks to create room for the new one. And periodically, maybe once a day, you might run a much slower model that basically looks at the entire cluster and decides to do some kind of global rebalancing decision. Right? Like, so th this is how you work with our API. 
So such a programming model is only as useful as how efficiently we can support it under the scenes with the compiler, right? So let me give you a bit of overview on what goes on here. So the DCM compiler at a high level takes in a bunch of SQL in the form of these constraints and the schema. And, it, and this program goes through many transformations. And at the very end, depending on what backend we use, we generate some code that interfaces with the particular solver toolkit. So our flagship backend generates Java code that interfaces with the Google OR tool CPSAT solver. So the view I'm showing you above, the corresponding Java code might look something like this. This is quite hideous, so don't read too much into it. But all it's really doing is iterating efficiently over some tables using nested loops or index-based accesses, filtering out irrelevant rows, and for what's left, encoding these high-level expressions from SQL into lower-level constraints using the formalisms exposed by the constraint solver. Now, while this Java code has to run, run quite fast, what's most important is how we do this encoding. Because constraint solvers are not some silver bullet that's going to magically solve all your problems. They have to be wielded very carefully. And in general, solver performance is quite sensitive to how you frame and present the problem to them. To give you a bit of sense as to why, let's take a look at, at a very high level and very simplified level, how CP solvers like the Google OR tool CPSAT solver works. So let's say I have two variables, v1 and v2. I want to write a constraint that v1 is not equal to v2. So what the solver does behind the scenes is that every constraint gets backed up by this object called a propagator. And what the propagator for a constraint does is that if one variable changes in a certain way, it knows how to propagate that change to other variables. So to give you an example, let's say the domain of these two variables is five, six, and seven, and six, eight, all right? So let's say the solver as part of the search step fixes the value of v1 to six. So now the propagator that we have for the not equals to operator propagates that change from v1 to v2, causing six to be removed from v2's domain, and now we have a solution here. So ultimately, this const the constraint problem that we present to the solver is this complex graph of variables and corresponding uh, propagators or constraints. And when the domain of some variable changes, what happens is that it triggers a lot of these propagations and that causes even more variables domains to change, which causes even more pro propagations. And finally, you reach a fixed point where you have a solution. So in this manner, when we go from this high level SQL to this low level Java code, we try to make sure to the extent possible that we are not introducing unnecessary variables and constraints because that affects the size of this graph. And so we try to frame problems in terms of what's called global constraints, which you can think of as recipes for constraint satisfaction problems for which solvers implement specialized algorithms and propagators. So it's really advisable to use them. So our compiler embodies these two principles in the form of several code generation strategies and rewrite tools. And in a, to give you a sense of how important they are in a benchmark problem, where we assign 50 tasks to 1,000 workers, we find that a literal translation of SQL to some constraints takes about 25 seconds to execute, which is uselessly slow. Whereas when we incrementally enable the different features in our compiler one after the other that embody these principles, we find that we can actually bring this down, the runtime down to like 85 milliseconds, which is quite dramatic. And you need these to skip. So that was it for the uh, for a description of how DCM works. I've already summarized the highlights from the evaluation before, but I'll go into a bit more detail on our scalability evaluation with, with the Kubernetes scheduler. So our experiments were run on a 500 node scale Kubernetes cluster, where we deployed a series of apps in an open using an open loop workload generator. An app is basically a bunch of identical pods. And we draw the characteristics for these pods from a publicly available trace released by Azure. And this trace gives us CPU memory characteristics for these pods, as well as the number of pods per app. And to make things interesting, we're going to configure these apps with interpod anti-affinity constraints, which prevent two pods from the same app to be placed in the same uh, nodes. Now, this is an interesting constraint for several reasons. In a lot, in in practice, talking to many operators, we find that this is actually a recommended best practice. And people even run automated tooling to make sure that you can't deploy anything to a Kubernetes cluster without these 
uh, constraints configured because that gives you better resiliency, right? If a node fails, it, don't, it doesn't take down a lot of your pods with it. But at the same time, it's a challenging constraint for the scheduler to support because it involves reasoning across groups of pods, which is a bit challenging. So let's see how this plays out. So I'm going to show you a graph with several CDFs. On the x-axis, you have the end-to-end -end pod creation latency. On the y-axis, you have three different uh, CDFs. And this corresponds to three different cases where we, con where we adjust the fraction of apps that we're configuring with these constraints. So on the very top, you will have CDFs without, where we've run the experiment without configuring any anti-affinity constraints. And by the third column, all the, uh, all the apps have this anti-affinity constraint configured. So for the, the first case, let's look at how DCM and the default scheduler perform. So we find that uh, the DCM-based scheduler takes about an, an additional second at the 95th percentile latency to bring up a, a pod end-to-end. -end. And this is for two reasons. First of all, the default scheduler is sampling and only looking at half the nodes in the cluster, whereas DCM is looking at all the nodes in the cluster. So there's a bit of a natural edge. When the default scheduler looks at all nodes, the performance here is comparable. And second, DCM either way has to talk to an off-the-shelf constraint solver and a database in its criti critical path. So we have a few more steps on the path to finding a solution than the current heuristic-based scheduler. But note how as soon as we ramp up the amount of constraints to evaluate, the Kubernetes scheduler gets slower and so slower, whereas the DCM-based scheduler's performance stays roughly the same. And at the last configuration, which is the state of uh, recommended best practice, we find that DCM cuts nine, the, the 95th percentile latency in half compared to this heavily hand-optimized Kubernetes scheduler. And this goes to show that the algorithm, the algorithmic prowess of the constraint solver trumps things that we can craft by hand. And there's a lot of value to using something like DCM to automate this effort for us. So there's a lot more details in the paper. I won't have time to go into all of it. We cover things about the compiler's internals, as well as how it's like to debug with DCM, the lessons learned in applying DCM to different use cases, as well as some discussions about DCM's generality and its limitations. You'll find all of these details in the paper. So that's all the time I have. I, I basically pointed out how policy-based cluster management code is extremely hard to get right today because the underlying algorithmic problems are quite challenging. And rather than having developers write code by hand to solve these same kinds of problems over and over again in different contexts in the industry, we think uh, we should instead be generating the required code from high level specifications. And we present a design to do so and find that it significantly lowers the barrier to building this type of policy-based cluster management code that scales well, computes high quality decisions, and is extensible over time. And we validate this in the context of three different use cases. That's all the time I have. Thank you very much. Uh, do send us any questions you might have. Check out the code. It's available on GitHub. And have a look at the paper. Thank you.